Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, where we explore the historicity and reliability of the Bible and archaeological evidence. My name is Henry Smith. Today, ABR is very pleased to announce and share with you the publication of our volume on our excavations at Kerbet L. Makader. Today we'll be talking about actually volume two, which is from the later period of time, around the time of Jesus and just before that, to talk about the discoveries, the importance of the work that we've done. Uh, joining me today is Dr. Scott Stripling, uh, ABR archaeologist and director of excavations at Biblical Shiloh. Hi, Scott. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. Well, hi, Henry. Glad to be with you and excited to talk about this topic today. All right. All right. So we're talking about, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's set up the context for our friends out there who may be hearing about what is Kerbet el Makader. That sounds like a foreign language, which actually it is. It's Arabic, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Right. So, so let's set the stage for our brethren who are hearing maybe about this for the, for the very first time. Okay, the site is 10 miles north of Jerusalem. It's on the east side of Highway 60, the Patriarch's Highway, uh, within Area C of what many people refer to as the West Bank or Judea Samaria. We excavated there from 1995 to 2016 um, with a hiatus of about eight years in the middle. Uh, we argue in Volume 1 that this is likely a biblical eye of Joshua 7 and 8. And in volume two, I make the case that this is likely biblical Ephraim of John eleven fifty four. Okay, very good. That's a that's a tour de force summary. Um, okay, so you know we were there largely twenty years. We had some hiatus time because of political up, uprising. Uh, give, give us a sketch of sort of the occupation periods and per perhaps zoom in on our volume two discussion because that's what we're going to focus on today. If you could. In, real quickly, in Volume 1, we have the Middle Bronze 3, and then Late Bronze 1, and then there's a gap of several hundred years. There's Iron Age 1, period of the Judges, and a little bit of Iron Age 2, and maybe a, even a tiny bit of Iron, Iron Age 3. And then Volume 2, which is now released, and which I was the, the author of, we're dealing with the Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine periods, which is actually quite fascinating at the site. Okay, so... Uh, Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine. So we're talking about anywhere from 300 BC-ish, all the yeah. way, all the way down to when's the Byzantine period end? 600 or so, right? Yeah, I mean, for for us, I, I, it's probably 749, the the terminus okay. uh, with the Great Earthquake of 749. But we would be starting really at the end of the early Hellenistic period, beginning of the late Hellenistic period. Or another way to say it would be late Second Temple period. Okay. Okay. So, what are some of the some some of the key things that we found there? Let's talk about that earlier period first. Often you're calling it Second Temple. Sometimes in the old vernacular it was intertestamental is what we call it. Yeah. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that era maybe and what we know better about it because of the work we've done at Kerbadel Makader, Scott. Well, what's really neat is we can see a transition in the archaeological record there between this uh, the pre-ritual purity wave and the post-ritual purity wave. So we have our Hellenistic strata that we, we do not have stone vessels in that, that stratum. We do not have mikvot. We do not have ossuaries in typical Second Temple period tombs. Um, in the next stratum, just above that, these things appear. So the Eastern Terra Sigillata, where, for example, disappears, it's replaced by stone vessels in the archaeological record. And so this is a microcosm for enabling us to understand Judaism in that time period, which really prepared the, the time for the coming of the Messiah. In the fullness of time, Galatians 4, 4, God sent his son into the world. So there was something about the material culture of that world that was ready for the Messiah to come. Um, so through this microcosm, we can understand a much broader picture Jerusalem, for example, is difficult to, to excavate many times because of urban sprawl. But here, our site had nothing built on top of it. Granted, we had vandalism and other things to deal with, but we were not encumbered by modern buildings. So by understanding this small site, we can then extrapolate out and understand what was happening in Judaism at that time. Very good. Very good. OK, so that's just, you know, that's sort of the setting the backdrop before we get into the New Testament period. Maybe in our next segment, we'll go into New Testament. Let's let's draw the lens out a little bit, Scott, and talk about 
one of the things I, I, that you, ever since I've met you, that you've emphasized so strongly is the importance of publication. There, there's, there's many stages of all of this, you know, finding a site, getting permits, getting volunteers, raising money, blah, blah, blah. But publication is something that sort of rises or falls, as it were. Explain that to our audience. Well, absolutely. The goal of archaeology is not excavation, it's publication. Because in the process of excavation, we destroy the evidence and we make it inaccessible to others. And so it's our responsibility to ourselves, to history, uh, to people of whatever their, their thought persuasion might be, is to give them good, clean, accurate data so that after we're no longer here and the site will probably have something built on top of it, and no one else would have access to it, they would then be able to look at our data and, and accurately assess what was going on uh, in history. As, as a believer, of course, I believe that history is, is a reflection of God's God at work. And so yes. by doing it accurately, then many times we can synchronize with the biblical text or even extra biblical text to understand what he was doing in, in history. Yeah, you know, you know, one of the things that struck me about, now ABR has always worked towards publication, but your emphasis on this, it kind of pointed to the lessons of the past where we've actually had excavations in Israel, not us, but others, where they don't publish for sometimes decades or not right. at all. And I'm not asking that question to, to bash others, but just simply that that's not really what we want to do. Maybe comment on that right. a little bit. You know, our goal, Henry, at ABR is to be avant-garde and to, to be leading the way, to be setting a shining example of excellence in publications, excellence in methodology, excellence in technology, and so fortunately, we were able to meet that five-year goal that we had of ending an excavation and publishing it within that five-year period, which most digs don't meet, um, although I'm happy to say that more are doing it than, than used to. Um, it would have even been easier for us had we not rolled immediately into another dig, which has, of course, occupied much of our time. Yeah, yeah, right. There was a big, big challenge. We never had a break between Kerbet el Makater and Shiloh. And so you have multiple things going on, which makes the accomplishment more impressive. And uh, a part of uh, the ability for you to succeed as the lead archaeologist in this is the the staff that you've collected. And we're going to talk about them mm -hmm. in our next segment because I know you want to you want to talk about how this yeah. works. Like you need a team to make it work. So friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We're here with Dr. Scott Stripling. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological field work and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. We're here talking about the final publication of the Kerbet L. McCotter excavations with Dr. Scott Stripling. Okay, Scott, um, it's a monumental achievement to put together a 400 plus page publication. And this is just volume two. We're not talking about volume one, but right? So we're going to be talking about an enormous amount of work. Uh, not something you can do alone. Uh, of course, you've provided the leadership in many ways. Uh, tell us about the team and what it takes to get this done. My goal was to establish a collaborative team of scholars and in publication to give all of our key guys who had been faithful, if they were qualified and faithful, I wanted to give them an opportunity to be a part of the final publications as well. And that includes not only ABR members, but other scholars in Israel with whom we have built close relationships or outside of Israel too. guys like Shimon Gibson and Lane Rittmeyer, who are world renowned scholars who had worked with us. I wanted their names to be on chapters, too, maybe with my name next to it uh, as, as co-author of some of those chapters. But I wanted people to see that this just wasn't ABR. It just wasn't stripling or wood, you know, as, as an evangelical out trying to make some point that archaeology supports the Bible, when they saw names like Frankie Snyder and Boyd Seavers and, and Pettit Sruven and Yoav Farri 
uh, Shimon Gibson, Lane Rittmeyer, that they would look at this along with our substantial scholarship and, and see that we were all in agreement on the data that was being presented. And I felt like that would give us gravitas. And so we did put together what I like to call our dream team. Yes. And uh, not only do we have a great site to work at, we have great people to work with and our home team, you and Scott and the rest of the, the staff and the home team. And then our, our team abroad, just everybody went above and beyond to to bring this to fruition. A amen to that. I think I think that's a wonderful way to give tribute to the hard work and the sacrifice that's been done. And 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 our volunteers, our hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, we could add to that. Uh, just extraordinary. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the publication, uh, the, the company that published it, uh, Archeo Press. Uh, why them and uh, what, what uh, obviously you developed a relationship with them. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, we were planning to go with Eisenbronn's. Um, and then in the, the med, as we were just starting publication, they really weren't looking to do more dig reports. And so I, I went out to some, some of our friends who publish and just asked them, you know, can you recommend someone that would be ideal? And it was Shimon Gibson who recommended Archeo Press and uh, it just seemed like a really good fit. Talked with David Davidson and, and knew that we were going to be able to work together really well. And they've been they've been great to work with. And I think they've been happy with us as well. And let me give a shout out, by the way, to my co-editor. So I was the author, but Mark Hassler and I were the editors of this volume. And so Dr. Mark Hassler from Virginia Beach Theological Seminary, a longtime square supervisor and field archaeologist, um, just, just was uh, editor extraordinaire. And so Kudos to him and the rest of the team, Abigail and, and Suzanne and Brian and, you know, Katie and Victoria and, and Melody and artists and Mike, Mike Ludini's got probably a thousand or two thousand photos in this thing. And yes. yeah, I know I'm going to leave some people out, but just so many people that I'm thankful for. Well, all those names, right? Uh, all those all those people that have been part of the story. So let's talk a little bit about like, uh, OK, so they're going to publish it in two ways. We're going to make available a printed volume, but just talk about that because people listening they hey wh where can I get this how do, how do I pick it up uh, talk about that a little bit yeah it's really exciting it'll be open access and uh, people will just be able to go to the Archeo Press website or link from our website at ABR directly to that and it's very affordable um, in fact it's so affordable that it's free as a download <laughs> so this is unheard of you know people archaeology archaeological reports are normally hundreds and hundreds of dollars and yes. they're very technical and hard to get except in research libraries we wanted it to be available to everyone freely you've received freely give and so anyone can download the pdf if they want a hard copy they're actually really affordable we're talking about in the 89 dollar range you know thereabouts uh for for volume two so we're really excited to have have this available and it'll be cited much more freely when we put it out there um, on our academia pages and and as open access and in as a as a print volume. All right, all right, very good. Okay, so good. So we got a, a big picture. Let's zero back in a little bit on the archaeology. We talked about the the that intertestamental uh, you know Hellenistic period. Let's talk a little New Testament, Scott, uh, uh, because that's where it really scratches the itch. Uh, yeah. Tell us tell us a, a, some of the highlights from the New Testament period. Well, when we uh, began to reveal these these remains, we had uh, domiciles, uh, really nice complex courtyard houses. We had olive presses, wine presses, subterranean features everywhere. There's a whole chapter in volume two on the subterranean features, which, by the way, I should credit Devir Ravi for helping me with uh, with chapter four. Um, so this became very clear that it was a Jewish village in the late Second Temple period. And as we looked at the identity of that village, it became clear, and I've written on this and I deal with it also in volume two, that we were probably looking at uh, Ephraim of John eleven fifty four, 54, where Jesus spent with the disciples the last month of his life prior to the triumphal entry. And if I'm right about that, that's really significant because that was kind of a, uh, an opaque period. You know, we know a lot about the week of passion. But we didn't know much about that last period of Jesus's life. So when we're dealing with the, the coins, like between 13 and 1400 coins and the stone vessels and everything else, we may be dealing with things that Jesus and the disciples actually interacted with. 
We have the human skeletal remains, the eight murder victims that we excavated at Kerba del Makara, which became a huge uh, international story as well. And these are people who may have very well interacted with Jesus and had seen the second temple. So uh, the human aspect of it was really, really interesting. And then, of course, Jesus himself predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and this, this what we would call the, the Great Revolt. And uh, our site fell to that. It's terminated in 69, very likely when Vespasian marches uh, through the, the north there, kind of in a mop-up campaign. My ideas on this have been picked up by a number of authors already, uh, like Aharonovich and other Israeli authors who are, are citing this. And now that the final publication is out, we hope that there will be a lot more traction to, the, to that idea. So, so uh, yeah, we made the case that we, we think this is a very plausible site for Ephraim and where the army came marching down. So it turned out we were looking for Joshua's eye and we found a lot more than what we were anticipating, Scott. And, uh, you know, I, I think I'll let you comment on that on the other side about how archaeology is, how it, how it can be very unexpected at times. <laughs> well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. Uh, we're here with Dr. Scott Stripling. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. Scott Stripling. We're talking about the final publication of our work at Kerbet L. McCotter. Okay, Scott, uh, we, we left off the last segment just sort of talking about you go into an archaeological dig with certain expectations. You're looking for, in our case, Dr. Wood was looking for I. Now, we knew there was remains there from later periods, but boy, what a treasure we found. You've described some of that. T talk about uh, the, uh, the mystery of archaeology. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> it's uh, really serendipity because uh, we can postulate what might be there. We end our excavation with the research questions. And Dr. Wood certainly had his, his research questions, but they were very narrowly focused on, on that transition between MB3 and LB1, and then the transition between LB1 and LB2. And so in for many of the seasons, uh, Dr. Wood was looking at unencumbered remains. And so many of those unencumbered remains did not survive in good condition because they were unprotected. Um, that's what a kirbit is. It's sort of a, a ruin. It doesn't have the profile of a tell. What I wanted to do that was a little bit different, building on his excellent work and standing on his shoulders, was to go into these second temple period remains. I thought that not only would we be able to explore a fascinating time, the New Testament period, but that underneath it, we would find well-preserved Bronze Age remains that we'd be able to publish. And in fact, that's what happened. And so it was really kind of the daily double for us. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, just to explain to the audience just a little bit, the later remains, what we're talking about, New Testament, covered over the old stuff and preserved it for us because the site had been destroyed so badly by farming and erosion and all that. So it was like a, a sort of a laboratory of preservation. Now, Scott, one thing I, I, uh, I forgot to ask you about, we also have remains from a later period, a little bit mm -hmm. up on the hill. Talk about the Byzantine monastery and its significance, if you would. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful bit, uh, monastic complex on the hill. Uh, one of the earliest in Israel, it dates to the fourth century. And in phase one, it was a single apse structure. Later, there were side apses that were added. We're in an earthquake zone. And so the structure was destroyed by, by earthquakes. We have a series of Samaritan revolts in the fifth century. It suffered destruction again. But through various phases, we were able to document how the Christians were emerging, how they understood God and his work in history. And the fact that, for example, that church is built on the blueprint of Solomon's temple. We discovered that on a ratio of two to one from holy to most holy space, um, 
very early monastery, destroyed finally in about 749 BC. Most of the explorers like Condor and Kitchener and Robert Robinson and others, when they came to the site looking for I, as a matter of fact, told by the locals that I was at Kerbin el Makata, they found the ruins of the church, which were significant up on the hill. And that was the logical place for the Bronze Age city to have been. But they didn't see anything and they would just report, well, there's nothing here but a church. Had they only, like Victor Guerin, actually, in the 19th century, was the only one that if he had just walked another minute or two over the hill, they would have come down into those Bronze Age ruins. Because it was an illogical place down in the saddle where Kerbin el Makata is. That's not where you would normally put a city or yeah. fortress. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it really is fascinating. And our theory has been the Byzantines commemorated biblical events. So is, yeah. it, is it Joshua's eye? Is it Abraham's tent, Genesis 12? Or... Was Jesus Ephraim. Jesus as Ephraim there, and it was commemorating yeah. Jesus? So those are interesting possibilities of why the monastery right. uh, and was if put you there. Think, think about, for example, on the Madaba map, those are things that are being commemorated, including Ephraim is on the Madaba map. Ephraim, where the Lord stayed. So we know that Byzantines were doing that. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so let's back it up a little bit. Uh, something you mentioned in passing, coins. People love, uh, co love coins. Uh, yes. Talk about the volume and the kind of coins that we discovered. 1,322 coins. <laughs> Two of them were gold, five were silver, a couple were lead, and everything else was bronze. So overwhelmingly bronze coins. And here's something that we discovered that I'll kind of give, give the viewers today a, a sneak preview of. Most of those bronze coins from the Hasmonean period, and like 700 of them were coins of Alexander Janaeus or his successors. So uh, over half are Hasmonean coins. They're minted in the first century BC, but they continue in use all the way through the first century AD. And that's not only at our site, that's at sites throughout Israel. So this is confusing. So put yourself in my position. You're trying to date uh, the various strata that we have. The pottery is clearly from first century AD, but the coins are clearly from first century BC. <clears throat> and so once I figured it out that they were continuing to use the Hasmonean coins, and in my view, this is a form of passive resistance against Rome. I mean, they they prefer the older Hasmonean coins when you had Jewish independence, and they avoid the the, the Roman coinage as much as, as possible. So, yeah, the, the, the widow's mite, what we would call the Hasmonean coin, the, the silver coins are so, so rare, and then only two gold coins. Um, we think about stories that Jesus told, like in Luke 15, about a woman who had 10 silver coins. Well, now that we know how rare those coins were, we better understand that parable. And that's just one example of how archaeology does come alongside and illuminate the biblical text. Very cool. Okay, I got to put a, put a plug in for myself and my team uh, because we found the mm -hmm. oldest coin that we found there around 300 yeah. BC. This official called Hezekiah. We had a young man in our square, Christian Velasco, at the time. He was 14 years old. He was yeah. the only he was the only one that could fit down through the hole, and <laughs> that's where we found the coin. So I'm going to take just a teeny bit of credit for that, Scott. I hope that's okay. Well, you should. Um, it's actually a little older than that, closer to like 350 or so. Uh, see. I I should have uh, my date right. We were close, and you got the kid right, Christian. Um, and we're always looking for skinny people, okay, because we can fit them into real small areas. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, Scott, believe it or not, we're down to about a minute. Uh, okay. Feel free to sum this up any way you like uh, and uh, go for it. I want to end by giving thanks to our thousands of ABR volunteers. Uh, who either came and worked on the dig, who donated money, who prayed for us, supported us with you know kind and encouraging words, those who participated in the publication and those who couldn't. Um, I'm extremely grateful. And while my name is on, on the volume, I realized that it was Bryant Wood who launched the excavation. It was our home team at ABR that supported us. And it was all the team around me that made it possible. So I'll just end by saying a great big thank you to everyone. Uh -huh. That, that's perfect, Scott. Thank you so much. And thank you for providing uh, such excellent leadership and uh, just, uh, just really push, putting things forward. We're, uh, we're, it's just a privilege to work together. Thanks, brother. Thank you. 
All right, friends. Well, uh, we hope that you'll uh, pick up a hard copy of the Kerbin L. McCotter Volume 2 or download the free one online. We'll make that information available for you. Uh, but you'll find it an interesting read, uh, fascinating discoveries, uh, again, showing the background of the biblical text, the reliability of the scriptures, and uh, our pursuit of trying to do our work with excellence to the glory of God. Thank you for supporting the ABR ministry and our digs. We hope to see you on a future dig, perhaps, at Biblical Shiloh. Have a great day.